of NWA. And our vision, which is sadly makes us different, and it shouldn't because it's the right vision, it's the vision that I hope others will begin to adopt, is that education should be kid-centric. It needs to be about kids, but I think it's beyond that. And one of the things we really believe at NWA is that actually there is a lot to learn that kids can take responsibility. So I want to introduce to you an author. Actually, her first book was at age seven. Um, you know, she started reading at age three. Uh, she is, in fact, a lecturer, a speaker, a uh, humanitarian, and uh, she is somebody who has a perspective that is shared by NWA. And the, the thing that is so cool to me is the fact that this insight and the concepts and the ideas that she has developed are really the kinds of things upon which we can build and, and uh, effect and accomplish the kinds of things we need to do. So now, at the ripe old age of 13, let me introduce to you Adora Savitov. to kids. And I'm so honored to be here at this gathering, especially here in Portland. Um, I actually come from Washington State, from Red Bay near Seattle, so you may know where that is. But I was born in Springfield, so I am, I guess, an Oregonian in Washington. <laughs> and, and, um, but whatever, whatever is more favorable. Uh, <laughs> 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 well put. Um, so, as I said, I'm here to talk about possibilities, um, particularly in the form of dreams and dreaming. And no, I'm not talking about nightmares or the sleeping dreams so much. I'm unfortunately not very qualified on that. But rather the dreams that maybe you had when you were little. Think back to those days not too long ago. Looking at you guys, you know, you're a pretty young group. Fairly <laughs> 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 so. Um, and, uh, again, con convenient for the purposes, right? <laughs> rather the dreams, rather the dreams that you had, maybe about becoming the world's fastest readers or a trivial pursuit champion. This or building a robot to clean your room, more Calvin and Hobbes kind of style, or maybe building that elusive treehouse in the backyard, or more accurately, getting your dad to finally get around to doing it. I'm looking at you right now. Um, <laughs> maybe it was a dream of writing a book, or starting a company, or maybe even bringing electricity to a rural village. Whatever your dream was when you were a kid, think back to how many of you got to accomplish those dreams. The reason I'm asking this question is because there are kids and adults everywhere who are dreaming of different possibilities every day. And just as though there are those people dreaming of possibility, there always seem to be the people who say, oh, that's crazy, ha ha ha, good one, like that's ever going to happen, or hmm, you can do that when you grow up, good idea. But it doesn't have to be this way. By understanding where the problems lie, we can change how our schools, our societies, how we think about possibility, particularly the potential of kids. For instance, maybe you've heard the saying, let kids be kids. To me, this saying is just a little bit puzzling, because when you say let kids be kids, are you saying let kids throw temper tantrums, play with Barbies, succumb to peer pressure, hit their little siblings? <laughs> or do you mean let kids form model UNs, have intellectual discussions, participate in speech and debate contests, plan events, form their own opinions? Too often, I think that let kids be kids is taken to mean forcing children into this idealized mold of childhood. I doubt, however, that that's what each one of you thinks it should mean. Let kids be kids is a saying in need of a rewrite. For one thing, what does it really mean? 
Last Mother's Day, my sister and I took our mom to see this movie called Babies. It was actually a documentary film, maybe some of you have seen it. And it was this really cute movie and it featured the lives of these four babies uh, from countries all around the world. And it presented quite a juxtaposition between babies uh, from developing countries and in the developed world. And it was really interesting because it gave this cultural perspective really without words. They were in North America, Africa, and Asia. And the baby from the US, Hattie, was from San Francisco. And her family was kind of stereotypical San Franciscan. They were like really eco-friendly, vegetarian. <laughs> Took Hattie to baby yoga sessions, read her books every day. Um, you know, maybe not stereotypical, but. <laughs> I don't know. That's where, that's where the image, when I think of San Francisco parents, maybe that's sort of what I think. But I think that. When, when you think of let kids be kids, maybe you think of letting kids do, run off, do whatever they want without too much adult interference. So, uh, in that respect, then the baby from the Himba tribe in Namibia, Punija, was, was left pretty much to her own devices. They were devices like dirt and the occasional bone on the ground. Uh, and it was really interesting to see her interact more with her natural environment. So who is to say what the ideal childhood, or in this case, babyhood, should look like? Just like babyhood, childhood comes in different shapes and forms and varies across cultural boundaries, too. My mom ran this informal after school for many years in our home, and one time there were these two siblings, a brother and a sister from China, who came to practice and, and shape up their English. And so they were always studying incredibly hard. And one time my mom asked them, why do you study so hard? And they said, so we can get a good job when we grow up. And that was their definition of childhood studying so that they could get a good job when they grew up. That was their idea of what their childhood would be. Then there are the kids who take on jobs bigger than themselves. Like one time I saw in the news the story of a brother and sister, actually coincidentally, who were taking care of their many younger siblings because their mother was sick. These varied cultural definitions of childhood only make me question more. What exactly does our ideal mean? What is the ideal childhood really look like. It's one of those things like the great American novel that's incredibly subjective and up for debate, which is why Let Kids Be Kids is inherently so confusing. And why should adults be doing the deciding in the first place? Here's what I and a lot of people probably think about the current definition of this saying. Uh, you know, let kids do whatever they want. Don't place a whole lot of responsibility on them. Do your best to not give them too much stress. For those that define let kids be kids that way, I have news for you. A lack of responsibility does not necessarily equal a lack of stress. I watched the documentary, you can tell I'm a kind of big movie watcher, and it was called Born Rich, and it highlighted the, the troubles and the lives, the successes, all the different aspects basically of life of the uh, extremely rich inheritors in the United States. These were kids born into families with names like Trump and Vanderbilt, uh, and they had millions of dollars to their name from the day they were born, pretty much. But the fact that they would never have to work for money came with its own set of troubles. You saw them drinking, abusing drugs, and having this lack of motivation to do much in the world. And while I'm not making, and while I'm not advocating making your four-year-old pay for the utility bill, then I am advocating that you give kids an amount of responsibility, because really responsibility is not a bad thing. It seems like another implied meaning of let kids be kids might be the desire to protect kids from the harsh realities of life from the dark side of the world. The thing is, that's kind of setting us up for a disappointment. The world can be a nasty place sometimes, and we have to understand that life can't always go our way. There is injustice and cruelty happening somewhere pretty much every day. If I grew up thinking that the world was perfect, that I would always be happy, then I would be far more spoiled and far less happy today. My parents didn't turn me into a little misanthrope. Oh, the world is so terrible, filled with awful human beings. They didn't endlessly denounce the hopelessness of humanity. Um, instead, they told us, you know, here are the problems. This is what you can do to help solve them. And because of our knowledge of global problems, I think that my sister and I grew up to be more empathetic. And uh, I was actually had the opportunity to work with several charities and nonprofits. Last December, I went to visit uh, the World Food Program's operations in Sri Lanka, where I got to see the school meals feeding program. And they've had so many issues with internal conflict, flooding, which happened very recently. And yet, there was still a lot of hope. 
these people really understood the value of education. So talking with them, I learned a lot, and it was an incredible experience. It opened my eyes about what hunger looked like on a first-hand basis. So you see how possibility can grow out of something seemingly so hopeless, of this terrible situation where people don't have much access to food, and yet I was able to learn a great deal from it. And I hope that the people I talked to um, also, I'm, I'm hoping that they do something from the visit. When you shield children, you're really depriving us of knowledge, and knowledge is power. Knowledge of the world's pressing issues means, in many cases, the ability to fight it. Another news story I read, um, this was actually last year, I believe, Phoebe Russell of San Francisco, California. Um, she was on a drive with her parents, and she saw some homeless people on the street, and she was asking, why do they look so sad? What are they doing exactly? And her parents told them that they might be hungry. And so she, uh, this idea took root in her mind, and she went to a local food bank, and she asked how she could help. And she started collecting cans of food from her school, from relatives, from friends, and she actually got some total strangers to collect money from can refunds, and she was eventually able to raise enough money to feed uh, 18,000 meals to hungry people in San Francisco. 18,000 meals from a little five-year-old girl. Mm -hmm. This isn't an average childhood. How many of you have five-year-olds at home who have raised enough money to uh, feed 18,000 meals? And yet, I think that most of us can agree that this is a good thing. What's wrong with being different from the norm? Mm -hmm. A lot of adults, when I'm telling them, you know, this is what I do, I'm 13, I teach, I speak, I write, uh, a lot of them, one of the first questions I ask is, oh, okay, that's great. What do you do for fun exactly? You know, <laughs> do you have friends? It's, it's not quite sounding like that, but I can understand that they're a little bit concerned about whether I have a childhood. <coughs> And this brings me to another topic. What is the big obsession with childhood anyway? I can't figure it out. <laughs> I mean, I, I, can get, I can get the anti-aging stuff a little bit. <laughs> I mean, it's, 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 it's often, from what I can see, it's, it's very both ways. A lot of young kids talk with a lot of excitement about what they're going to do when they grow up. I want to be a fireman, I want to be a writer, I want to be a princess or whatever, you know, because there's was, we actually, when I was little, we had one of those little things from Ikea that we got as a free gift. That was, what do you want to be when you go? And we were so excited about putting the magnet on different things. And, but then, to grown-ups, uh, they're like, well, you know, our childhood was such a fun time, or do you have a childhood? They, they seem to be concerned about this issue of childhood. Maybe it's like a retirement, minus bladder issues. And <laughs> <laughs> Problem. 
So, <laughs> LKBK, I think, inherently shows a certain amount of underestimation. And one of the great things which I've seen looking at the way that adaptive testing works is that it doesn't underestimate, it doesn't really estimate at all. It lets you decide how far you want to go. And unfortunately, that same attitude really hasn't yet taken hold in our society. We still say, not maybe literally, but a lot of times our attitudes, you, you can play around the mud, you know, you can go to the sleepover with your friends, but I don't know about publishing a book quite yet or becoming an animal rights advocate or lobbying your political representatives. That's just maybe not quite a kid thing to do. Obviously, not every adult talks or thinks or acts like that, but even being apathetic to someone's dreams can be just as hurtful. When my mom held her own informal survey on Twitter and Facebook asking her friends what LKBK really means, she received a very wide variety of responses. Some had a, an enlightened view. They said that it meant letting kids be imaginative, inquisitive, and curious. Others responding to the meaning of LKBK questions said that it meant lots of noise, silliness, and fun. If when you think of it, you imagine you know, running around outside, making tree houses, that sort of thing, that's fine. I think that uh, we need to get outside more and play around, but that doesn't mean that we can't publish books and start companies, too. Mm -hmm. Along this line, one response particularly stood out to me. Let kids be kids is just parents' way of keeping kids from doing what they really want. <laughs> the chance to make your dream a reality is something that comes too rarely. And somehow this idea of letting kids be kids or let them do, you know, let them just go to sleepovers and stuff, it excludes the fact that we have dreams and ambitions too. Our bodies are growing, so why wouldn't our minds and our dreams? Maybe you've heard adults saying to kids, you know, wait until you're older, or that's a great idea, I look forward to seeing that when you grow up or something along those lines. You may have always you may have noticed that it's always what do you want to do when you grow up? as I was talking about earlier, not what are you doing right now, what projects are you working on, what things have you done. And the problem with this is that our dreams are not in suspended animation. They're not just hanging in a bubble waiting to expand as soon as we turn 18 or 20. One poem, A Dream Deferred by Langston Hughes, I read this and I thought, you know, this is really kind of the same idea. And it goes like this, what happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun or fester like a sore and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat or crust and sugar over it like a syrupy sweet? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load or dust explode. Dreams and aspirations are at least as important as childhood activities. What's more, making dreams reality, like mine, publishing a book at the age of seven, it didn't exclude me from going out and making giant mud castles in the backyard. I'm really living evidence of that. Ultimately, some of our greatest ideas came from youth who didn't defer their dreams for the sake of this average childhood, and whose parents didn't say, no, wait until you're older either. In 2010, uh, it feels weird that that's last year, but in 2010, I hosted this conference. It's called TEDx Redmond. And what it did is it brought together 18 of some of the US's brightest kids from all walks of life, who, um, and our speakers were, were all youth. Our audience was all youth, and it was created and organized all by youth, so uh, definitely all in the youth action. But one of our speakers was Jordan Romero, and some of you may have seen him on TV or know him because he became the youngest person to summit Mount Everest. And it was his seemingly ridiculous dream to summit the, the seven, to climb the seven summits, the tallest mountains on each continent, that launched his dream. He saw a mural, and he told his dad, he was like, you know, I'm going to climb all these mountains. And Jordan Romero was lucky in that he had access to the resources needed to become a mountaineer and support from his parents in reaching his aspirations. But there are also many striking stories of dreaming and possibility from children who seem to have all the obstacles of the world in front of them. For instance, Alexander Scott, or Alex Scott, was born with a debilitating childhood cancer, which from a very early age, doctors said, you know, she's not going to walk, this is going to make walking impossible, but she actually began to stand up and walk. There's these stories of doctors being wrong, and it's amazing when it's, when it's wrong in the right way like that. And after learning that her tumors were growing again, then she set up a lemonade stand to help raise money to fight pediatric cancer. She raised over $2,000, and when she passed away at the age of eight, then she knew that she had raised over one million dollars for pediatric cancer research. Wow. Today, the Alex's Lemonade, Found Stand, uh, Lemonade Stand Foundation 
raises money to help fight cancer uh, for kids who have pediatric cancer. And um, so her dream, raising millions of dollars with a lemonade stand, sparking this movement, it might seem unrealistic. Maybe if your kids told you, I want to raise millions of dollars with this idea, what would you say? But if really what we can learn is not necessarily just that these amazing ideas can work out sometimes, or that you should defeat all obstacles. Those are things we can learn. But also the ideas, you don't know if they're going to work until you try them. Alex's story tells us that it's never too early to have big dreams, and it's never too early to work on them either. Another person who came from a seemingly obstacle-ridden background, William Cam Kwama, grew up in poverty in rural Malawi in Africa. And to explain his story, here's a bit of a riddle. What can you make with blue bone trees, an old bicycle, and scrap metal? Put that together with a few other things. And if you're William Cam Kwama, then a bike plus scrap metal plus blue bone trees and a fair amount of determination equals a wind turbine. <laughs> yes, a wind, a wind turbine that actually powered electricity. It gave him a single bulb at first on the roof of his room. And this was, this was he was basically, people were treating him kind of like in uh, the story of Noah's Ark. <laughs> they thought he was crazy, basically, that this was a stupid idea. What is that crazy kid doing putting all of this uh, scrap metal and stuff together? And it looked ridiculous. I mean, you look at this. And you were, and, and, if, and if you came from a background where probably electricity wasn't common, basically almost no other house in his village had electricity, you probably would think that was pretty crazy. But through his environmentally friendly efforts, William was actually able to eventually light up his village. The story spread, he went to speak at the prestigious TED conference, he went on a number of shows in the US, he's now going to college, and this was a kid who had been forced to drop out of school because his parents couldn't afford the $80 a year tuition. We might have read about electricity in the classroom. Some of you might even be college graduates in a science area. Uh, but how many of you have built wind turbines that actually work? William did. <laughs> As for myself, I didn't, I didn't have any of the obstacles that, that these amazing people had. Uh, I had all those resources, like electricity, guaranteed access to food and water. I never had cancer. My parents spent a lot on education for me, and if you look at the number of books that we have in our house from, from a very early age, it's easy to see how much money they spent. It's quite a bit, I'm sure. So it was natural that I loved to write, being surrounded by books, being surrounded by knowledge. I started writing when I was four years old, and these were stories like, okay, kid goes to eat a cheeseburger at a restaurant, kid comes back home. They didn't have exactly a Tolkien-esque plot. Or <laughs> <laughs> Far from it. But at the same time, my parents weren't like, yeah, my dad's giving me a look like she's nowhere close. Um, but my parents were like, you know, this is, this is pretty not great writing. They, they weren't like, hey, you, you know, you need to really fix that grammar right there. That's not spelled correctly in, in a harsh tone voice. Or get back to your piano and violin. They, they were like, oh, that's great. And when I was six, my mom actually got me a laptop computer so that I could start typing up my stories. My spelling eventually improved as a result. If my parents had said, wait until you're older, uh, when I asked them, I, you know, I, I'd like to get published, if they had said, wait until you're older to this silly idea, this heresy that a little seven-year-old kid who had written some short stories wanted to publish them, then I wouldn't have published my book. I wouldn't have started speaking to kids at schools, telling them about why reading and writing was so awesome. I wouldn't have traveled around the world spreading this message. I wouldn't have uh, spoken at some of the conferences that I've spoken at and met some of the world's most extraordinary people. I wouldn't be standing here today. This list of milestones, though, belies the fact that my road wasn't always smooth and easy. Many publishers weren't very encouraging. One large children's publisher actually saying that they didn't work with children, which <laughs> I said, I, 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 didn't, I, didn't actually, I didn't actually think of the irony at the time, but later, later when I was thinking about this, I was like, kind of alienating a large client there. <laughs> publishing me, I actually called them up, we got them on the phone, and they were willing to take a listen to my ideas. They took a leap, published my books, Flying Fingers and Dancing Fingers, and from there on it's gone to speaking at hundreds of schools, keynoting with thousands of educators, and standing here before you, which I am really privileged to be able to do. If the numerous conference organizers with whom I've worked, if they had said, if they had taken Let Kids Be Kids at face value, 
If they thought, oh, this child, she's giving up her childhood. She's, uh, you know, she should just be in school and, and uh, you know, advancing a normal pace. And maybe when she grows up, then she'll be a writer or something like that. If they thought that, then they wouldn't have let me speak on these stages, since they're stages truly designed for adults most of the time. This is the kind of accomplishment that let kids be kids ought to include rather than discourage. This is LKBK 2.0. <laughs> and that's why I believe in allowing the student to define the extent of possibility for us to decide how far our dreams and possibility take us. You see this represented with the parents who support their kids when they want to go above and beyond. You see this with the teachers who make efforts to differentiate in their classrooms. You see this with what NWEA is doing in adaptive testing. Allowing students' aptitude, not their age, to determine how far they go. It shouldn't just be a testing method, it should be life. It seems like each couple of centuries has its own attitude toward kids. In the early 16, 17, even 1800s, then children were thought of as miniature adults. This is actually a portrait that I saw when I was, I think I was studying art or something. And, uh, it was kind of scary. And, <laughs> and, and this, this whole idea of, of the, and basically what, what I learned about was that these portrait artists, they really had during some of the winter months when it was harder to get from place to place to get their customers, they would often pre-draw like the body of the portrait sometimes and then draw the head when they actually went to um, draw the person. So what turned out was these weird pictures of kids on adults' bodies. Uh, kind of similar to that. And the thing was that they weren't just painted that way, they were also expected to work that way, behave that way. They would work in the fields uh, as well, just like their parents. And in Victorian times, the motto was a little different. It was more along the lines of children should be seen and not heard. And more recently, it's been let kids be kids. You might think that this is a more humane way of treating kids, but I think that we've advanced uh, a lot from Victorian times, just as attitudes towards women and people of color have advanced. The way that we view and treat kids throughout our history provides a lens through which to see how we, as a culture, uh, have developed. Nelson Mandela, he, this is one of my favorite quotes of his, he once said, there can be no keener revelation of a society's soul than the way in which it treats its children. When we judge a society, we have to see how kids' dreams are fulfilled, how they're encouraged to excel. We must create a world where kids are truly free to be who they are. Like all of our previous attitudes towards children, let kids be kids is generally said by a bunch of adults, meaning then that it's not our idea of who we should be. Rewriting this definition of let kids be kids is no longer just an issue concerning me personally, but one that concerns everyone in our communities, our societies, and our world. It's up to the next generation to solve tomorrow's problems. And whether we can do it depends on how we let kids be kids, how we let kids expand on the possibilities that lie before us. If you saw out in the gallery all of these ideas, what happens when all kids learn, these are the kind of possibilities that we need to embrace. So you know, when it comes down to it, I agree with let kids be kids. That is, let kids be everything they can be. Because empowering me and my generation is engendering the progress of humanity. Thank you. Incidentally, the rumor that Darlene retired from Congress in fear that Adora was going to move to her district uh, is overstated. Uh, an unfortunate wording in the Constitution says that can't happen for about another 12 years. Uh, the vision of education that NWA has is very simple. We view ourselves as a catalyst. Tonight is about us being a catalyst. We want to be a catalyst in this community. We want to be a catalyst in this state, as we already are. And for the five million children that we serve throughout the United States, and increasingly around the world in about 70 countries. For 10% of the children in America, growing at a rate of 22% per